The more and more I do car videos, the more I'm surprised at what viewers want to see. In my head, I thought, well, everybody's going to want to see Ferraris or just pure sports cars like the Chevy Corsica. But no, over and over again, this has been requested. The Mazda CX-9. Believe it or not, the CX-9 is on the same architecture as the CX-5 and the Mazda 3. You would never guess because this thing looks immense. It's wider, longer, it's just more beefy. Now when you talk about exteriors, everybody's got a different opinion. And you look at that, I almost got in a fist fight over that grill with Turbowski. Straight on, I think it's one of the best integrations on any Mazda car. But when you get to the side, it looks like you drove it into a wall, and that's what he said. And the more I look at the car from the side, the more I feel the same way. So let's talk about the front. You have LED accents in the headlights, much like all the new modern Mazdas, but you also have LED low beams and high beams, which are a really nice touch. The light output is excellent at night on this car. Coming along the side of the CX-9, this is where you start to see that upsizing effect that I spoke about earlier. The lines work really well on this vehicle specifically. It doesn't look awkward like it does on some of the smaller cars. One of my favorite parts are these gunmetal-ish 20-inch wheels. And yes, I know the tires are going to cost a ridiculous amount for this car, but it looks so good here. But where this falls apart, and we talked about this in the shop, is this. These plastic, non-painted panels all over the car, and it just is a total distraction here. And then on top of it, they stick this chrome finishing accent on it. And it just, you know what, I would actually would take this and I would have a body shop paint all of it. I, I just don't like it. The back of the CX-9, I can just describe it really in one way, and that is streamlined. The lines are really clean. There's just not an overuse of anything. I'm not a huge fan of the chrome, but the taillight design is compact. The center lines are compact. It just looks really clean and efficient. Now, unlike the CX-5, this has a power lift gate, which is just like every other power lift gate. It's way too slow. You really don't have much manual control over it. Uh, so for a vehicle like this, of course, you're gonna have an electronic lift gate. I, I couldn't see them doing a manual one. It's just too big. Here's what's good about the back end of the CX-9 is everything's manual back here. To flip down the seats, the actual headrest goes down automatically when you pull this lever and you push it down. Now pulling it back up is a little bit of a stretch and I'll be honest, I don't like it at all. I have longer legs. If you're really short, this is probably gonna be a pain in the ass for you. The second thing I don't like is these handles here, these release handles. They, are, they feel so cheap. They feel like I would, could literally break them off and probably a hundred times of pulling this, especially if you're really reaching and in a hurry. I don't know how they're gonna hold up, but I'm just saying, try them out for yourself. Uh, the next thing is there is a ton of room when you fold down all these seats. Now the other negative here is there is a huge gap in between. And I noticed that right away when I threw my tripod in the back, it would always get stuck in between the seats. And God, does it piss me off because I can't reach it from the back. I have to go in the back door, dig it out and pull it up. And I can't move these seats back, the frontal seats to, to create, close that gap. And I'm not sure if there's something I'm missing here, but it's definitely something to note. So we are under the CX-9 and what we've learned about this uh, is that for the most part the architecture underneath is shared with the CX-5 and the Mazda 3. So 
a lot of all this has been reused. Now in terms of suspension components, linkages, bushings, uh, tie rod ends, all that type of stuff is all unique to the CX-9 and has been upsized because this is a much larger vehicle. But you can tell with the frame structure and the subframe structure how much room is in this suspension and the wheel wells on this because they've moved things outward. Uh, and it uh, obviously it's nice because you can actually see in here for once. The front part of the underbody is like identical to the other Mazdas we've seen. You have front aero panels. All of this is covered up for airflow purposes. There is strategically mounted drain holes and holes all over the There's place. There's very amount, large amount of holes. You uh, should count them. I, it would probably take a week to count all these holes under here, but you're no, you're no uh, stranger to counting holes. So we do have a, a service panel to get to the oil drain cock and the yeah, filter. But why do they have two screw type fasteners here and two push in type fasteners I, here? I why not know. just go all four of these? Cause these are going to break off or some Yahoo's just going to throw them out. Right. And it's going to fall off anyways. I, I don't like it. Strut based front suspension, no adjustability for alignment aside from toe, but something you notice right away that's different from the other Mazdas. What's that? The rubber isolators. Oh, yes. Vibration dampers. They have them strategically placed along this car. You have one on the lower control arms, uh, and you notice some other ones too. The two I don't on know. the struts. Yeah, two on the actual struts themselves in the uprights interesting and the actual wheel wells are coated with a material to reduce road noise it's a felt like fabric that reduces tire and wheel noise tire road noise whatever so that's really about it on the front scott so as we get to the back in the middle of the vehicle this is an all-wheel drive model, and I cannot believe they offer a front-wheel drive only for this because of the torque output at low RPMs. But these on-demand systems in most all-wheel drive cars or SUVs of this type are primarily front-wheel drive biased. Now, the drive shaft is always spinning while it's driving, and this whole rear end is activated via an electromagnetic clutch, which is controlled electronically. So when the computer decides that it needs to send power to the rear, sends voltage, locks that clutch, and can slip the clutch as well to send power to these rear wheels to balance out the power split front to rear. Now, this is not any different than all the other systems from Toyota, Hyundai, Honda, all of that, it's the same. Now, where Mazda differentiates, where they talk about this all the time, is their use of sensor data. Uh, they want to make this as proactive as possible, which means it looks at ambient temperature, it looks at steering angle sensors, it looks at g-force, yaw rate, so it knows if you're on a hill. If you're on a hill, obviously, it wants to send the power differently. It knows when it's super cold out, potential snow. When your windshield wipers are on, it knows when it's wet. So it can always adjust the power before you get slippage. It can react faster than you can. So that's their big thing. They spent a ton of time with that. Now, in terms of the actual drivetrain, from talking to Dave, or I've emailed Dave some questions, this is almost identical to the CX-5. Uh, the differential is identical. They haven't really upsized it here. Um, most everything is shared from the CX-5, and actually in the CX-5 during the planning, they knew they were gonna build this, so a lot of it is very similar. This is the way of the future, bro. The big wheels and big grills. Yeah. How much are these? 200 bucks. What's the tread life? I didn't even look at that. I was afraid to look the at pertinent that. Pertinent information, 300. God. Okay, so you're gonna pay for a really crummy set of tires on here. About 165 is gonna be about the lowest you're gonna find. These are 200 and you can go all the way up to about 289. Winter tires are about 180 for this. So it's something to note in terms of consumables and you'll probably get what two years out of these three <laughs> years driving, you're driving it a year yeah with all the torque in the front at least you can rotate them because i think you're going to be tearing up the fronts if you're driving hard you said this hood is is almost as long as that what 1963 bonneville this is 
what I say, 48 inches from the metal to here, that's 52. The Bonneville's 52 and this yes, is 48? and that has a proper engine and a proper layout. What's not proper about this? Just look at it. My God. Okay, so let's talk about this because this is a big deal. A lot of people that are huge Mazda fanatics or fans in general have been waiting a long time for this 2.5 liter to have a car that makes some horsepower and torque. So, so here it is. They should have built a V6 instead this, of did this to a four cylinder. They didn't want a V6. They were, that's why they built this is to avoid having to do V6s and V8s because they feel they can get the same effect out of a turbo four as a V6, have it more powerful, more efficient, and 10 times more complicated. It is complicated, I'll give you that. I would not want to work on this car. I just, we looked at it front to back and compared to the regular two liter and 2.5, this is vastly more complicated. So let's talk about what makes this special and why they did it the way they did, because this is much different than a lot of the other turbo applications that are out there. For one, it still has a high compression ratio why didn't they just do a diesel? That's what this feels like driving it. Because diesel has more problems with emissions. And they, they do have a diesel in Europe, but they can't bring it over here because they can't get it certified to pass California emissions, all the emissions nonsense. So that's why they're doing this. So the first thing that they attempted to do was create a turbocharged motor that has almost no turbo lag. And to do that, they've had to custom make or custom design a head with three exhaust ports instead of four. So your outside cylinders have their two exhaust ports. Your middle two cylinders share one exhaust port. And they've done trickery with the way they get the exhaust gas out to help pull the exhaust gas out of those middle, middle two cylinders so all the exhaust gas is coming out efficiently. So one of the ways they've done it is to build a exhaust manifold connected to the head and the turbos right after it. So you have head, exhaust manifold, and butterfly valve, and your turbo sandwiched together. And that middle butterfly valve allows the actual valve to close on those three exhaust ports. And what it does is it routes exhaust gas upward to three smaller exhaust ports which it creates a highly more compressed airflow to spool up that turbo almost from idle. So they're using a trickery through the head design, through this exhaust manifold with a butterfly valve to reroute the gas to spin up the turbo fast. And when that turbo gets going, they open up that flap, all the exa exhaust gas is flowed out full speed for higher RPM action. So what it gives them is the ability to have no turbo lag at the lower RPM, provide consistent linear power. That's what this is all about. The next, so we got a couple other things to talk about. The EGR system is cooled. Well, that's what this has, an EGR cooler. And the whole idea is to cool that exhaust gas that's going back into the intake or into the engine to reduce cylinder head temperature. High compression, higher risk of knock, they want to reduce the risk of knock. Really, there is so many tricks in this engine in terms of head design. They've taken measures I asked about carbon buildup. Uh, that was the big thing. Now that they have a turbo on this, how are they going to deal with intake valve carbon buildup from the direct injection? And they Dave, won't have it. Yeah, that's no, what Dave's just, answer was. They're not going to have to deal with it on here because... Because the air blows too fast past the intake valves that can't ever stick. Right. Well, no, it wasn't so much about the, <laughs> the speed of the air. I know. It was about the temperature that they're able to control the combustion and the ignition temperatures and all of that in the cylinder head to prevent the carbon from building up. If you can keep the temperatures in there at the proper range, you don't get as much carbon buildup. And the way that they've designed their actual cylinder walls, their ring design, all of that, there's very minimal blow by, including the way they've done the turbo seals. There's a lot less oil, a lot less blow by. So long story short, Dave is saying that carbon buildup on the intake valves is going to be a non-issue on this motor. So we're just gonna have to take him for we'll his word. See. Now adding a turbo, which Mazda has not had for a while, you run a heavier weight oil, 5W30, to handle the heat, the higher temperatures. So I asked Dave, do they run an engine oil cooler? And they do 
run an oil water heat exchanger for this car. So technically oil cooling should not be an issue unless you're in maybe really, really hot climate, uphill towing situations, but overall it should be a non-issue for this car. So now the more real question, we could talk about all the technology in here. That's a more in-depth discussion and you can find more about it on the internet. But the biggest thing that people want to know is will this fit in the Mazda 3 and the Mazda 6 and the CX-5? If they put a five foot long front end on it. Actually, sure. that's, they, they've said that it will fit in those cars, that it will be, this could drop directly into all of those because it's the same architecture. Your market, you're gonna start doing swaps. And do some swaps. But after, I hadn't driven this car and I heard about it and I was excited about it because I thought this would be really good on a Mazda 3 or a 6 or even a CX-5, right? So after driving it, there's no way this is gonna go in a Mazda 3 or a Mazda 6. It would be an absolute nightmare to drive. It would be horrible. There's too much torque at the bottom end to control all of that to front wheels on a lightweight no, no, platform. No, no, you turn the engine the right way, okay. send the power to the back. You're not gonna do that on, a, on Mazda 3 and 6. They should consider it. Base everything off the Miata and just Just build, it, it build that outward? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I think most people would want. The CX-9, it's time to take a drive and I've chosen suboptimal weather. Parts of pavement are wet, others are dry, which is a good test for the all-wheel drive system in the CX-9 and including its new power output. So let's take it around the pavement that is broken and see how it does over some, uh, some shop. The CX-9 is a cruiser, but it's definitely more on the sporty side. The big bumps sometimes unsettle it, but for the most part, 90% of bad pavement feels smooth in here. In terms of road noise isolation, it, it does a really good job. I mean, these are huge 20 inch wheels, so sometimes you feel a little bit of tram lining, a little bit of pulling when you hit some bumps, but for the most part, I think they've struck a really good balance here without having to use a, a, you know adjustable dampers to, to get the sport on the smooth pavement and for it to soak up the bumps on just all the bad stuff too. We got problems. Hey, get in my car. Get in here. No, they don't want to get in. They never want to get in. And the CX-9 is Mazda's quietest vehicle ever. Now, part of the trickery is, as Dave Coleman and other engineers have stated, is they were able to reduce so much weight out of here they could add some back, which means they've added sound insulation into the doors and particularly the floorboards, and it helps a lot in the overall quality of the, the driving experience, specifically on a vehicle like this where it's more of a cruiser. You're gonna buy this for comfort and not you know, sporty driving. Now in terms of fitment and quality, it, there are some rattles in here and it's coming from one of the pillars on the front right passenger side from the plastics around the windows. And I pushed on it, pushed in different areas and it's a little annoying, but that's exactly what happens when you start to silence everything down. Every little creak vibration you start to notice. And that's something that can be very frustrating. Personally, over the life of a car, I'd rather have a little bit road, a little bit more road noise than trying to track down these nagging little creaks and rattles everywhere. The next part about the driving experience is this HUD. And now you no longer have a flip up plexiglass screen that I wanted to rip off. It's projected on the glass like cars have been doing since the 80s. And it's a pretty good HUD, but I have to turn it off because it's LED backlit, there's some flicker, and when the car has vibration, you start to see the actual uh, projection onto the glass vibrate with the car, and to me, it's very distracting. So you can turn it off in the actual infotainment menus by going under settings and AD display, and you have to actually scroll down and uncheck active driving display. Done, easy, except when you turn the car back on, it automatically turns back on every time. It doesn't stay off, which is super annoying to me that I have to disable it every time. So then you have to go into the height adjustment, move it all the way up, whatever. This is technology for you. Mazda's finally got a turbocharged engine that makes some significant amount of torque and horsepower. So what is it like 
accelerating in this vehicle. Let's check it out. I'm gonna brake torque it just a little bit to get the, the turbo up, just so you can see the best case scenario here. So, first impressions, you feel a lot more torque than horsepower. That initial push back into your seat at the lower RPMs is where you feel everything. As it starts to wind up towards the higher RPM, it falls off, and you actually have to shift sooner in manual mode to get the most out of it. Let's check out the handling in some of these damp roads. And I have traction control off, and I'm in manual mode. Dry pavement now, so we'll get some dry grip very well dampened over the tracks. You can feel that all-wheel drive system working with initial understeer and then it starts to neutralize a little bit. It's pretty good. Now we're gonna turn uh, sport mode on in the transmission, not manual mode, and turn traction control off so it, all the stability systems are on. There's a little bit of understeer. Uh, the steering weight is heavy on this car and uh, the one of the things about it is they've tuned this to give you some steering feedback. For a big car it communicates really well with what the vehicle's doing at all times. A lot of SUVs or heavier vehicles do this light steering feel to give you the sense that the vehicle's lighter than it is and then you turn in so quick and it upsets the car. You don't have that problem with the CX-9. Now the thing is this is still a heavy SUV. It can't completely hide its weight. The all-wheel drive system can only do so much to kind of neutralize the handling. Now, with the turbo in this car and the way that the turbo is tuned to give you all that torque up front, it tends to torque steer the front a lot, especially when that boost comes on. And it's not as natural and not as neutral as the other Mazda cars I've driven. So I'll tell you the first thing I did. When I got this vehicle from the fleet company, I wanted to try out to see what the power delivery was in 87 versus 93 because the ECU on this car will adjust for different types of fuel and give you more power. It won't pull as much timing using 93 octane. So I burned through that initial tank of fuel. And the one thing I noticed about it was definitely you lost horsepower at the higher end. It felt like you fell off a cliff. You'd get all this torque and then about 4,500 to 5,000 RPMs, nothing was happening. There was no pull. So I flushed all that out, got 93 octane in here. And after about hundred miles, you can definitely feel there's a lot more pull in the high RPM. It just, it doesn't fall on its face fat, as fast as it did with the 87, which is really good for somebody who wants to drive this in a more aggressive fashion to have more linear power delivery, and I really like that. You can drive it more like a normal sports car because this is tuned with 87 octane to not do that. It's designed for people that aren't gonna put their foot down. Yeah, so these tires aren't particularly the greatest on wet. As you can see there, it washes out a little bit uh, with the stability system off but usually it will, inter it will give you a little bit of slippage with the stability control on. Obviously it's set up for safety and it will correct, but this is definitely more understeer prone than anything. That's to be expected too. I mean, it's, it's an on-demand system. It's gonna favor front wheel drive. Let's take it through the turns in fully automatic here and see how it does. Now I don't have, yeah, I don't have a lot of confidence in these tires. Uh, there is torque steer. You can feel the wheel tugging at you a little bit in this car, of course, because of the, all the torque delivery. And, you know, they don't have the best lateral wet grip all under steering through there. But what's impressive overall is that you can drive this in an aggressive manner and have a little bit of fun for the size and weight of this. They didn't just want to sterilize all the sport out of it, which I can really appreciate. There's comfort, there's good steering feel, there's good low end power for daily driving. And that's a huge, huge factor for most people. You don't have the, to wind the piss out of this 2.5 liter turbo to, to get it going. 
again, you really have to back off on the wet. This thing wants to understeer for sure. Torque steer, see how the brakes do here. Good, brakes are solid, there's no confidence issues. Yeah, this is some of the price you pay for having all that torque, 300 pounds at the, su such a low end. You start to wash out, you start to lose traction, and that stability control system has to work a little bit more to keep the car in shock. Last but not least, the transmission. And I've said this about other Mazda cars. This is one of the best automatics. Uh, regardless of price point under like $60,000. It's a torque converted setup that has the torque converter locked up almost all the time. Uh, it has um, almost instantaneous downshifts. It rev matches all your downshifts. So when I go from fourth to third, second, it's never jarring. It's, it's always ready to go. Uh, up shifting and down shifts, shifting is a total joy here. And um, it's one of the best parts about Mazda automatics, I'll be honest. It, and it doesn't, it's not a drudgery like some of the other vehicles, like your SUVs from Toyota and Hyundai, they are just so slow. The transmissions are just tuned for one thing, and that is not doing much or having any fun at all. You can at least have some fun in here by manually shifting it. And it's a big pro for me if I was gonna get a hauler like this. Now the transmission does an extremely good job in sport mode of automatically downshifting, keeping you in the power band at all times. So if you're in aggressive driving mode and you don't wanna manually shift this, sport mode will do it for you based on G-force. If it knows you're coming into a turn and there's lateral G, it will downshift, prepare you for the turn so the actual motor and the turbo's on boil, which is really nice. In regular uh, driving mode, not in sport, uh, the transmission just goes into the most efficient state and you'll notice that its programming is to always kind of shift about 5500 rpms well away from the red line to always keep you in the torque at the torque curve where all that torque is coming because the power falls off at the top end so at the end there's some big pros for this cx9 and the big one is this is the most refined Mazda ever made. It's quiet, it's comfortable, it does well over all pavement types. It's got a super sporty transmission, super smooth, and the motor has finally got some balls for a Mazda vehicle, uh, and it's fuel efficient. My worst tank, and that was just trying to blow through all the fuel as fast as possible, was 18.1 miles per gallon. Now that I've been driving it like a normal person, I'm getting upwards of 25, which is really good for the size of this vehicle. Now the negatives are, it's not as sporty as you'd think. It's not as fast as you would think. If you're running 87 octane, regular gas in here, all the fun is had in the first like 4,000 RPMs. You can't rev this thing out and make power. And that's, that's a big deal for somebody who's more of a driving enthusiast. If you're somebody that's putting around, it's gonna be a total non-issue. You always feel like there's power in the low RPMs, which is how you drive every day. But that's something to note. The other negative is the HUD. I can't turn it off permanently. I have to disable it every time I get in the car. And there's a couple creaks and rattles in here and just overall, some things they need to work out like the rear view mirror just is always moving. It's always loose. I mean, there's just little quality issues in here that I think that they can improve in the manufacturing process and the quality process over time. But overall, let's take a look at the overall interior experience. Getting inside the Mazda CX-9. This is the signature edition, which means it's fully loaded, totally tarted out, it's got everything that you'd expect, and this feels like an entry-level luxury car. This has got to be Mazda's best interior yet. You can tell their interior designers have gotten their shit together here. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's the diversity of materials, the choices they've made. If you've ever been into an affordable car with a black interior and all black leather, a lot of them look very bland and monochrome, and their attempts to kind of break up all that black seem kind of chintzy or cheap or just half-assed. Here, you don't have that problem. The upper dash has this soft touch material. It almost feels like leather. 
the whole middle section of the dash, they decided to go with this really dark brown material or dark brown, which also feels like leather that runs across the whole center dash and into the door panels where the actual door handles are. And it's just a really nice touch. And to just top all that off, they've decided to use real aluminum trim across the whole center dash and into the actual door areas, which is so nice after you've seen so many cheap attempts at recreating aluminum with plastic. Now every interior has its quirks, and as much as I like it, there are problems with it. So here they are. And I understand this right off the bat with all these matte textures, from a design standpoint, you need some shiny bits to break up all of that, right? So that's what they've done. There is this piano gloss or glossy plastic in high traffic areas, like the window switches, and in the entire center console, because this doesn't have the wood option. So what it looks like in here is it looks dull, full of micro scratches, splotches, and there's a gouge on the passenger side. And it just looks bad. It looks like you'd have to put a lot of work into keeping it clean, or it's just susceptible to all those problems. The second thing I absolutely hate is the Plastichrome. And they put it, again, on the window switch area and around this whole center console. And when I'm driving in the sun, I feel like I just want to put my sunglasses on because it's so reflective down here. I just can't get used to it and it's just not my bag. So whether you have a problem with it, you're gonna have to get in here and see for yourself. Back to the good stuff, ergonomics and the touch points, the things that you interact with every day. The steering wheel is excellent. No, it's not overtly sporty, but it's contoured just right as a daily driver or as a comfortable driver. You're not inundated with a million buttons on the steering wheels either. You have arrows that tell you what your forward and back is for your track selection. You're not doing any guesswork. Your leather uh, wrapped shift knob here on the automatic. If you're in manual mode, it feels really solid, almost like a manual transmission knob. The turn signal stocks, there's no digi turn signals or wiper stocks here. All your buttons are easily accessible. Your HVAC controls are a carryover from the Mazda 3 and Mazda 6 with the addition of the rear control here. Everything works so well, feels so high quality. The padding's in the right place for your elbows. Your right knee area is padded, uh, but your left is not, which sucks. Overall, this is a very, very high quality, luxury feeling interior. In terms of seats, these are the most comfortable seats Mazda's made in a modern car. They're better than the 3 by a long stretch, and they're better than the Mazda 6. They are pretty comfortable. They are not the industry best because there's a little bit of sportiness and firmness here, but overall I like them. The one thing I don't like is the driver's seat. The electronic control, I can't move the seat forward and recline or decline the seat at the same time. It's one button switch at a time, which is a pain in the ass if I have to move the seats forward or back for somebody in the back seat. The weird thing is the passenger seat's not like that. You can do both buttons at a time and it will adjust. So I don't know if that just needs to be fixed or if it's actually a programming problem. Last but not least is infotainment and the sound system. Now every single mod Mazda model with this infotainment is identical. There's no variation. There's not 20 different versions of the same thing, which means they've standardized it. And coming from a technical background, I really appreciate what they've done here. Now using it, is nice because it's a touch screen when you're stopped so it's easy to get around and it's very responsive and then you have a central command knob here in the center con console when you're moving once you master it stupid simple to use very little lag and the steering wheel controls are super intuitive as well it, it makes it a very comfortable non-intimidating user experience now the negative part is this is a linux based operating system and they had an api opened up to developers to come up with applications for this car and they have not done anything with it in two and a half years. There's still no Android integration. There's still no Apple integration. And it's falling behind in that regard. As much as it's quick and easy, there needs to be some ability for users to sideload different things to make it more interesting and more powerful to use for power users, really. The infotainment is run off this screen on the dash, which looks like it's stuck up here like a VTech My First Tablet for Kids. It does not go down, either physically or electronically. It's always there. And that might be a deal breaker for some. But you're going to see a lot of manufacturers starting to do this same thing. And, you know, it is what it is. This second row is where the CX-9 starts to get me real hot, real fast. And that's because it makes up for a lot of the problems with the back area. These seats adjust 
so well, so easily. They're split, obviously 20, 60, 40, whatever it is. Uh, it does recline, it has a recline feature. It's all manual, there's no power seats, and it's very comfortable. The way that this front seat, the actual back of the front seat is contoured, it's really good for creating knee space, which is pretty important because the second row is your most usable. But it does look like a five-year-old from a child labor camp stitched the back of these seats. I, they look horrible. There is HVAC in the back. It's not dual zone, but it, you, obviously at least you get some vents and some control back here. There is no heated or cooled seats in the back, so don't, uh, don't get too worked up about that. Compared to some of the other three-row vehicles I've been in recently, this gives you a ton of ingress and egress outside into, into the back seat. Namely, if you're a shorter driver in the front or shorter passenger, if these seats are up in the front a lot, I mean, it's like ridiculous. It's so easy to get in and out of here. It's like two feet, two legs easily. Well, almost two legs and I'm skinny. But if those front seats are back too much, it's, you're gonna have to be like an evolved chimpanzee to get back there. But I like the amount of space and I like the amount of room and the third row is pretty usable. Now the negative part is this seat, the bigger one, it takes a lot of upper body strength to move it down and up. Uh, and that's one thing, it's really heavy and I'm struggling to lift it one armed with my left arm. And if you're a female and you're petite <laughs> and you're struggling, this is gonna be a pain in the ass. And dare I say it, this is exactly why if you need three rows, I would always buy a minivan over this because you don't have to fight with all this shit. But I know I just said a dirty word for a lot of people out there that can't even fathom owning a minivan. So what's the conclusion? Well, that's pretty simple. This is the best mainstream vehicle Mazda's ever produced in terms of refinement, quality, comfort, uh, driving dynamics, interior space, attention to detail, and you can tow with it. It's a big cruiser without feeling like a big cruiser. Now, that's where some of the problem comes in because this still has some of the Mazda DNA. And what that means is trying to strip out weight where they didn't need it in complexity. Like you don't have a panoramic sunroof or seat coolers or seat heaters in the back seats. And those are things that people are going to be looking for and cross shopping for in more of a luxury level SUV. Things that Hyundai and Kia have in their vehicles that this doesn't. And I don't know if they're gonna steer people away from some of those other brands to sacrifice just for better driving dynamics. I just don't know. And that's one of the reasons why it's a confusing vehicle to me.